This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past. The only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming one of the great rock drummers of all time. And I am talking about Sandy Gennaro. Sandy uh, played in Michael Bolton's rock band Blackjack back in the late 70s. Uh, early 80s, and then uh, he went on to play with Pat Travers, Cindy Lauper, Joan Jett, the Monkees, many great people, um, and it's going to be a great conversation today. Um, he's just he's he's got this wide range of versatility as a drummer um, with different genres of uh, music, particularly in rock music and pop music, and. It's going to be a great conversation today. I just cannot wait. So yeah, here is my interview with Sandy Gennaro. Hello? Hey Sandy, welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm doing just fine. How about yourself? I am doing just uh, spectacular. and This is a uh, tremendous honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in Nashville. Where are you today? Redding, California. Oh, it's probably really nice there as well, Northern California. In terms of weather, it is, yes. Uh, is there a lot of fires and stuff there? Oh, yeah. In the summertime, it happens like every other day. Oh, uh, that's that's well. I hope you stay safe, man. Oh yeah, in my area, we're pretty safe over here. Good. So going back in time, I was reading. Uh, you start you started playing toy drums at the age of three, and by thirteen, you had started um, playing a friend snare drum set. Um, were there any uh, rock drummers that influenced you? Uh, yeah, uh, but just to correct, I got my first uh, toy drum at age three, you're correct in that, which I still have in my possession, that first drum down in my studio. Oh, yeah. And I, I, my mother bought me a brand new set of Rogers drums uh, in December of 1965. But the drummers that originally influenced me was, um, was Ringo Starr. When I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan in 19, February 9th, 1964, that that ignited the flame with me. I was always a pra- uh, attracted to rhythm since I got that drum and my older sisters played 60s uh, rock and roll around the house, or 50s rock and roll around the house, like um, Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry and um, Fats Domino and, and stuff like that. So I was always attracted to rhythm. Mm-hmm. But when I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, uh, that, was, that was the first time I actually saw a drummer play drums like actually saw a drummer play drums prior to that show i only heard uh drums on record so that that did it for me and then that developed into me listening to a lot of more uh, british invasion groups like the stones and charlie watts and cream and ginger baker jimmy Mm -hmm. hendrix and mitch mitchell uh led zeppelin and john bonham um i was always uh attracted to the British invasion bands. Um, yeah. And, th- and then later on, it was uh, right at that same time, I was a big fan of Vanilla Fudge with Carmine Apice. Yeah. Uh, Carmine Apice, depending on the pronunciation. Um, and he turned out to be a, a, good, a good friend to this day, Carmine. And then Aerosmith, of course, and uh, Mountain. They were oh, always, yeah. I was always a big fan of, of you know, the hard rock, but songs as opposed to metal or anything like that oh yeah that's all wonderful uh, how about dave clark dave clark definitely uh yes that's one i neglected to mention but dave clark was a was a really i was really uh attracted to like songs like glad all over and uh bits and pieces because they always seem to have the drums being prominent um they 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 had some really uh, like in bits and pieces, there's a great drum fill in the in the intro, and I saw them on Ed Sullivan too. Um, 
But yeah, Dave Clark Five. Uh, Dave Clark Five was a big influence. I I love those songs, and uh, yeah, as you know, as as like even like um, uh, uh, Hermits, Hermits. Not not as not that I'm gonna ever ever learn anything from the drumming on Herman's Hermit songs, but yeah. the song the songs were awesome. You know, the songs yeah. were very catchy and and I just loved the songs and I went on to work with Peter Noon as the lead singer. He's still singing and touring as Herman Hermits uh today. But yeah, it's it's just, I'm a very I'm very attracted to songs and then the drumming within those songs I align to, you know, but the songs mm. are the thing for me. It's not actually drum solos don't really do a lot for me. Mm. I'm more of a song guy. Right. So that that's basically what what that what that is. How about the uh, the early guys like Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich? Well, the, yeah, that that comes into play at the very beginning during that time where I got that toy drum for Christmas. Yeah. In addition to the '50s music being played around the house because I have two older sisters and they used to buy 45s all the time. So I listened to those those uh, singers or those acts that I've mentioned before, like Jerry Lee Lewis and Chuck Berry, etc. cetera. Um, but my dad and mom used to play big band music around the house too. And my dad, every once in a while, used to point, hey, you know what, that's Louis Belson playing Sing, Sing, Sing. And and uh, that's Louis Belson playing the drums, or that's Gene Krupa playing the drums. But again, I was attracted to to the sound of the drums, not necessarily the genre of music. Right. And then, but the visual, seeing Ringo play, and more more so, in addition to seeing him play, it was it was the songs, um, and it was the way the girls reacted to the Beatles screaming. And I said, man, I don't know what's going on there, but I want part of that. You know, is my my drumming <laughs> going to make girls react to that? To that, I said I want part of that. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, uh, I always admired the technique of a Louis Belson, a Gene Krupa, a Buddy Rich, uh, right. Billy Joe Jones, all those guys. Uh, but I never really subscribed to playing that music. I, I I respect them for their technique and for their you know for their prowess on the drums. But I I never uh, attempted to emulate them but i all, always attempted to emulate the british drummers that i mentioned before starting with ringo right do you remember the first album you ever bought uh the first the first album i ever now again i was exposed to al- albums around the house because i remember seeing the first elvis presley record that my sisters bought the lp right but the first album I ever bought was the Jimmy Are You Experienced Jimmy Hendrix record, um, and I, I lived on Staten Island uh, at the time, and I took a, the Staten Island ferry into Manhattan because on the radio weeks prior to the release of that Are You Experienced record, they were playing Purple Haze and Fire on the radio in, in, in New York, and and they were hyping the Jimmy Hendrix experience as this brand new band, blah blah blah. And the album was going to be released on a certain day at 10 a.m. And I went into the city and I waited online outside this record store on 8th Street in Greenwich Village. And um, when the store opened at 10 a.m., I went over to the, 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 the clerk and I said, I want the new Jimi Hendrix record. He goes, oh, it's in a box in the back. We haven't even unpacked it yet. They unpacked it and they slapped the price tag on it. I think it was like... Four ninety five or something. Right. I took it and bought it and went home back on the ferry and and I didn't open the record obviously until I got home. But I looked at that record and I just stared at that record the whole thirty minute trip across back to Staten Island on the ferry. I couldn't believe what what the pictures on that record. You know, you got to keep in mind that in in the nineteen sixty eight or whatever year that was. Right. Um. There was no internet. There was no access to videos. There was none of that. Yeah. <laughs> none of that. You know, you had to wait to see a band live in order to see the band. So all you had as a visual was the back of that record and the liner notes and, and the sleeve or whatever. Um, and incidentally, I played in a, a, a cover, a high school cover band at that time, you know, and that right. night uh, when I brought the record home, we had a band rehearsal. And we rehearsed Fire and Purple Haze. 
And that night we went on a battle of the bands at some high school on Staten Island and won the battle of the bands because we played Purple Haze and Fire. We, we, we ended up winning the battle of the bands because we played those two songs. That's cool. How about yeah. uh, your first concert? My first concert was my mother and my sister right around the time I first started. And I don't remember the year, but if you can look up the year that This Diamond Ring by Jerry Lewis, Gary Lewis and the Playboys, when that was a hit, mm -hmm. I remember going, my sister and my mother taking me to Atlantic City, and there was a venue in Atlantic, off the Atlantic City boardwalk called, uh, it was the, the pier, the Steel Pier, it was called, and they had acts at the end of the pier facing inland and we went and gary lewis was the headliner gary lewis and the playboys and their hit at the time as i said was this diamond ring but the opening act the thing i remember mostly about that gig was the opening act was a horse that <laughs> that that dove into the, the ocean and swam back to shore that was the opening act. that was the opening oh act, my god the diving horse and that's what I remember about it. But that was my first music concert. Was yeah. Gary Lewis and the Playboys the opening act, the Diving Horse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually heard of the Diving Horse, but wow, that is, Have you? yeah, that is crazy. Yeah, it was '65 that song came out. Okay, so that was it. That that was that was right. If it was '65, now depending on. When in 65, this was actually during, you know, it had to be during the summer or the spring or the fall. It had to be in clement weather because the gig was outside. Um, so, and I, first, I, as I said, I got my first drum set uh, December 31st, 1965. So uh, that was a year after the Beatles appeared, and it might have been after I saw Gary Lewis. Nice. So, so at 14, you, you joined the Black and Blues? Uh, well, yeah, I was the drummer in the I was the drummer in the Black and Blues. That was my very first band. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't know. You might have seen the picture uh, on my website or somewhere online, or I might, might have posted it of that of of my rehearsal space down in my mother's basement with the four pictures of the Beatles above mm -hmm. and the Delorage's drum set, and I put Black and Blues with Black and Blue electrical tape on the bass drum. Yeah, and the B was the B for black and the B was the B for blues. I thought I was very artistic. <laughs> and then right to the left of that, looking at the drum set, that was that was what I called, or what we used to call the Victrola, which played albums and 45s. If you put the little disc in the 45s. And there was no headphones involved. Again, it's 65, 66. So in order to learn songs, I had to put my ear to the four-inch speaker in the Victrola and play along as I as I was bent over with my ear to the speaker. And that's that one of the first songs I learned was I Want to Hold Your Hand by the Beatles. But I remember learning that song and other songs, like, you know, the, the songs I had to learn from my, my cover band, and like Purple Haze, and I, that's the way I learned them, was sticking my ear and yeah. copying what the drummer was doing. And uh, you, did you guys mostly do uh, blues covers? No, we did we did whatever the popular songs were of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, with the the one hit wonders. Uh, you know, there, there's a, a lot of them. We did Glad All Over. We did Beatles songs. We did Stone songs. We did Ninety Six Tears by Question Mark and the Mysterians. We did Come On Down to My Boat, Baby. We did Yummy Yummy Yummy. I Got Love in My Tummy by the Nineteen <laughs> Tips. I don't know how, why these songs are coming back to me now, but yeah, we did all the hits of the day. Because we wanted the people, when we played a high school dance or a private party or something, we wanted people to dance. And we, want them, we wanted them to be familiar with what we played. We didn't play originals or, you know, obscure blues covers or nothing. We wanted to be popular and we wanted to be, to provide a good time and a happy time for the audience. So we played whatever was in the top ten at that time. And you guys started uh, going on the road, right? Or that was later. Um, not the black and blues. No, that that was basically just a local local thing around Staten Island. Uh, we played all the high schools on Staten Island, private birthday parties and whatever. Mm -hmm. and then I got into a band called The Word, 
which now I was 16 at this time, and we started playing bars on Staten Island. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, you know, that eventually, a couple of years later, well, I did that for, you know, just playing in the metropolitan area, Staten Island and Brooklyn and Manhattan. Uh, that happened for until maybe the 70, early, like 1970. And then I joined a band based in Scranton, Pennsylvania, but it was just another cover band. And now we played in Pennsylvania. We played downstate New York State. We played, you know, areas around there. And then uh, that that morphed into this uh, co- another cover band based in Jersey uh, called the Howdy Doody Rock Ensemble. The band based in Pennsylvania was called Mutt Lee. Mm-hmm. And the band that was based in another, after that uh, based in Jersey was a band called the Howdy Doody Rock Ensemble. And that's when was my first, it was still a cover band, still playing bars, six nights a week, five sets a night. But we played them in Ohio, Michigan. We, it was a van, you know, everybody piled in the van. We set up our own stuff. We brought, up, brought our own PA and played six nights. And on the seventh day, we went on our day off, we went and packed up our stuff and drove eight, nine hours to the next gig. And then set up, in the next venue and played the next six nights. That was like, that was my a, a rock and roll experience because we, we didn't know where we were staying. We didn't have a road manager. We used to pull into, we had the address of the club and the yeah. date we had to be there. But uh, we found our own place to stay. We shared rooms and had the time of our lives. It was my first venture out of the metropolitan area. Did you, did you play um, on the same bill with other bands that went on to become successful? Um... Not on, not on that, not on that, not on that tour. It wasn't until like the mid, mid to late seventies when I moved to LA. Mm-hmm. Um, I, uh, I played in a band that opened for you know, we we opened for I don't even remember the Guess Who at the time, and um, but then when I moved to LA, I, I moved there to get out of cover bands and and play in original projects, and I started. I played in a, one original member version of Steppenwolf, and that was my first venture into like a national act. But it huh. wasn't even, uh, you know, a, an accredited situation because there was like three Steppenwolves on the road in California at the same time. All, yeah. Each of them had one original member in the band. So <laughs> I played an original uh, Steppenwolf with the original keyboard player, Goldie. His name was Goldie McJohn, who's since passed away. But right. so that was my first According to my research, before you got to be in Blackjack, uh, you were in a situation where you got to be on The Tonight Show. Yes, uh, that was just a random, having nothing to do with bands or music. That's when I moved to L.A. I was always a big fan of Carson, and I, mm-hmm. while, while I lived in L.A., in Hollywood, I sent away for tickets because he emanated the show from Burbank at the time, and I got tickets, right. and I went randomly in, in, to the show, and I got picked to sing uh, a song you know, to play on, to sing on Stump the Band. And if you know anything about that, that little game that Carson played, um, it happened like, uh, it happened, you know, that game actually happened like once every two or three weeks on the Carson show. And uh, the night I went, he not only played that game, which I was a big fan of, and I always thought, watching that show at home in my mother's house in Staten Island, I said, if I was ever on that show, I'd know exactly what song that I would sing, and I would definitely stump the band. They wouldn't know it because I wrote the song, and it was a country song, ironically. So when I moved to L.A., I got tickets, I went to Carson. Not only did I did he play Stump the Band that night, but he picked, I was I was seated in the third row aisle. And, and Did you see that video? No. Okay, you, you have to search, search it on YouTube because it's... Uh, it's pretty entertaining, and it was <laughs> it was done before I've done anything wor- worthwhile musically. Yeah. And subsequently, not only was my dream realized of being on Carson, but I I, fr- I freaking st- sang sang the 
stumped the band. I mean, I sang Tweezers of Your Love, the song that I wrote, and Carson ended up being my straight man. It was, it was unbelievable. And then I went on to be on Carson like three more times, twice with Lauper, with Cindy, and once with the Monkees when Jay Leno um, uh, hosted, but twice more with, the, with Cindy when Carson hosted. And um, he actually didn't remember. I went up to him and asked him if he remembered my appearance singing uh, Tweezers of Your Love. He said, no, you don't look. You don't really look familiar, to be honest with you. I see. He goes, "What song did you sing?" And I mentioned "Tweezers of Your Love," and he goes, "Oh, his eyebrows went up." He goes, "I remember that. I remember that song. That was awesome. You gave the band the chords to the song." I went, "Yep, yeah, you're right." <laughs> you have to look. It, you have to look it up on YouTube. Just search Johnny Carson stumped the band "Tweezers of Your Love" or something, or Sandy Gennaro, Johnny Carson, or something. It'll come up. Okay, I'll check that out. That's so cool. That must have that yeah. must, that must have been nerve wracking though, because because he's an idol of yours. Yeah, it was kind of nerve wracking to tell you the truth, because you know you see me on the video. I kept buttoning and unbuttoning my jacket like about three or four times, <laughs> and I'm, I'm standing there with Carson with the microphone to my mouth, and I'm looking, and like four feet away there was this big huge TV camera, and I'm going to myself. Man, every, every there were millions of people watching me right now. Yeah, I, to tell you the truth, I was really nervous. But I, I delivered a couple of key lines, which Carson got a kick out, kick out of. But you'll have to watch it to see. I sure will. There, there's a guy. He for the last I don't know seven eight years, he's had a podcast dedicated to Johnny Carson, where he just talks to everybody who was ever on the Tonight Show, uh, people who worked there, everything. I'm sure. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's does called. He still, does he still have that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He does it every Thursday. It's called the Carson Podcast. I'm sure eventually he'll reach out to you because he. Oh, that'd be awesome, man! I'd love to be on that podcast. Yeah, he's a savant when it comes to the Tonight Show. I mean, he knows all this guy. Can you? Do you have a way to reach out to him? Um, I mean, I, I could email him. I mean, I, I would like to have him on this show eventually, but. Um, Sure, I could. I could well, you know, uh, definitely could do try. Me a favor, that, that would be great to reach out to him and just, you know, tell him a little bit of the story I just told you, and maybe, you know, I'd love to be on it. Just, you know, you can pass my uh, pass my email and uh, contact information on to him. That would be great. Okay, I'll definitely keep that in mind. So, how how does uh, blackjack come into your life? Um. Uh, well, that that is. Uh, I'll try to make the long story short. I moved to LA, and um, I was trying. I, as I mentioned, I went out there to get my first big break in the music business, and nothing was really happening after three years. I was one disappointment after the other, mm-hmm. um, and I uh, I hesitate to go into the full story because it's a little bit lengthy. But I'm mm-hmm. trying. I'll condense it as much as possible. I had after three years, I had the opportunity to rehearse with. To, to audition for Rod Stewart, and the audition was held in a uh, SIR Studios, which had all the equipment already set up, the drums and everything like that, and it was a cattle call audition. But, and so people were going in and out, drummers were going in and out playing the song Tonight's Tonight. And when it was my turn, I was so insecure, I went out and got my own drum set, and the, even the road manager said, no man, there's drums already set up in there. Rod is, has that microphone in his hand, the band has the instruments on, just go in and play Tonight's Tonight. That's all you got to do on the drum set that's already in there. And I go, no, I got to play on my own drum set. So as a result, you know, you see the end coming here. The, the, I made Rod wait and the band wait. So I set up this double bass drum set to play the simplest song in the world, which is Tonight's Tonight. And I obviously didn't get the gig. Carmine Apice was a good friend of mine at the time. I mentioned mm-hmm. him and I mentioned the story to him. And I said, you know, Carmine, this is a lesson in karma, and it's a lesson of when you do something for other people, good things happen to you. So I said, karma, and I blew the Rod Stewart audition, but you know what? I don't think they found anybody yet. Now, if you know anything about karma at uh, peace, he's already played with Ozzy and the Vanilla Fudge and Jeff Beck and all of that. Right. So he's a superstar living in L.A., and I'm telling him, Hey, uh, Carmine, I think you should go down for that gig, man. I don't think they found it. He goes, do you, do you have management's number? And I gave him management's number. He went down and he got the gig, which turned out by his own admission to be the biggest gig in his life. He yeah. co-wrote the, do you think I'm sexy, whatever. But in return, 
in another conversation right at that in that period of time I said hey Carmine I said okay I don't know what to do I was as, as depressed as I ever was going to be because I blew what I thought was the biggest opportunity I was ever going to have to make to make it out of cover bands and I said can I use your name in, as a reference in a resume and he said sure so I sent 50 resumes out to managers that I really really liked the bands that they managed him and one of them was Peter Grant who managed Led Zeppelin Nice. Led Zeppelin's, uh, Peter Grant's mail went to the uh, uh, Led Zeppelin's attorney's office in New York to be forwarded to Peter Grant in England. I, 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 I sent my resume to Peter Grant, uh, care of Swanson Records in New York. It never got forwarded to England. Coincidence number one was the attorney for Led Zeppelin at that time opened up my resume. His name was not even on it. That's coincidence number one. That's karma number one. Yeah. Number two, right at that time, the attorney's name was uh, Steve Weiss. Right at that time, he's putting a band together around Michael Bolton and Bruce Kulick's songs. He's sending those songs out on a cassette to different labels. Labels are getting back to him saying, we want to see this band. We really, really like this band and these songs. Songs written by Michael and Bruce. So now, Steve Weiss needs a band because the label labels want to see this yet unnamed band. And he and Steve is shopping it, not as Michael, this is 1978. So it's not, it's before Michael Bolton became famous. Yeah. He, uh, he was shopping it as a band situation. So now he needs a bass player and a drummer Right at that, in that period of time, my resume arrives. He opens it, Steve Weiss does, sees that I'm a drummer, sees the L.A. address. He almost threw it in the trash, but he turned, he turned the page of the resume with my one reference, which was Carmine Apiece. He calls Carmine Apiece because guess what? Steve yeah. Weiss used to be the attorney for Vanilla Fudge which was Carmine's first band. He knows Carmine personally. Yeah. That's coincidence number three. He calls Carmine in L.A. Who's this guy, Sandy? Carmine vouches for me. The next call I get is from Led Zeppelin's attorney in L.A. Uh, do you want to audition, fly to New York to audition for this band? I went to audition for the band. I got the gig. The next day, Jimmy Haslip comes in. He gets the gig, and that's what started the band Blackjack. A couple of weeks later, we auditioned for Tom Dowd. Uh, well, first we auditioned for Polygram Records. We got the, uh, uh, like a seven-album deal with Polygram or Polydor Records. And then uh, we got Tom Dowd to produce the record at Criteria Studios. So the, the moral of the story is, is that no matter how down in the dumps you are, because I was hurting myself. When I blew that audition for Rod Stewart, I was hurting myself physically. I was hurting myself mentally. My relationship at the time with, with, the, with my first wife was falling apart. I had no money. I was 3,000 miles away from home. I was ready to throw the sticks in the fireplace, like figuratively, figuratively and literally. And I said, no, there was a little voice. And I remember seeing Ringo all those years earlier. And I said, don't give up. Don't give up. There was a voice wanting me to go buy another bottle of Jack and drink it. And yeah. then there was another <laughs> voice going, no, go, don't give up. Don't give up. Send the resumes out. Send the resumes out. Send the resumes out. As hard as it was on a freaking typewriter, one index finger at a time, typing those resumes to 50 different managers, it was the hardest thing I ever had to do. But sometimes you have to do, do what you never did before to get the results that you never had. And that's what I did. And it worked out because the Blackjack gig led to Benny Mardonis' Into the Night. It led to that album. Uh, being involved with Polygram, it led to the Travers, uh, my, my gig with Travers. And the dominoes just kept falling. But the universe wanted to see how bad I wanted to be a successful rock drummer. And that's the challenge that the universe placed, or God, or whatever you want to call it, placed in front of me in, in L.A., and I rose to the occasion. As tempted as I was to do another line or to drink another bottle of Jack and to cry another night to sleep, I, I resisted that temptation. I freaking wrote those resumes, and man, am I glad I did. Yeah, that is incredible. I, I give you full credit for that. Wow. Tom Dowd uh, was coming off of producing Eric Clapton. Uh, what was he like to work with? He was the best. <clears throat> I'm so grateful.
grateful for a lot of things that happened in my life, but that's one of the major things I'm grateful for is my first professional album project for Polydor Records was with the legendary Tom Dowd producing that record. And being that, and it was at the legendary, again, legendary Criteria Studios in Miami that are still in, in operation today. But at the time, it was a premier studio in America for anybody to record. And that was Tom Dowd's home studio, basically. And I remember reading Tom Dowd's name on the back of Cream Records and then on the back of Otis Redding and all of the Allman Brothers, Bee Gees, Eric Clapton, all these people. And I'm, and there I am as a drummer a couple of months earlier I was about to give up and there I am at a studio being produced by Tom Dowd and he gave me some very worthwhile advice he was like my he was like my musical father I mean man he and I being a, a band member I was able to stay around for the whole record it's not not just when the drums were done I went home I stayed around for the mix I stayed around for the vocals the overdubs the guitars keyboards everything and I've just sat in the back of the control room and I just wanted to be a sponge of whatever Tom Dow did. And he gave me some very worthwhile advice that I still use today, what is it, close to 50 years later. Were you disappointed the albums didn't hit? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was very disappointed because there was a lot of hype surrounding that first Blackjack record from the president of Polygram on down. They all had very high hopes about that record and it was the priority as far as promotion, it was the uh, Polygram's prior promotion department priority in 1979. It, it, they were, promotion department was told in, in 1979, put all the other acts on the back burner, the black, you have to break the blackjack record. So there was a tremendous amount of hype. We did videos in 1979 before MTV existed yep. to send to Europe and the Far East for promo. We had Tom Dowd produce a record. We had a nice... You know, uh, uh, our first album, uh, uh, the first run of our first album had, uh, we had a it, it, the, the album cover was like a deck of cards where it opened from the top instead of this, the standard sleeve on that you pull out the album from the side. But we had everything going, full page, four color ads and Billboard magazine, the back cover. Uh, we had the opening slot with Peter Frampton. We went on a Peter Frampton tour and promotion of that first record. Uh, we had everything a band could ever want in a first album uh, campaign, but it, it, the songs didn't resonate with enough people. So a lot of people say that it was maybe overhyped a little bit where, you know, we had in, even Polygram hired independent promotion people that, you know, back in the day when they used, to, they used to hand the program directors a, a little envelope under the table and it had a couple of tickets for him and his wife in Hawaii just to play the record. You know, right. there was a, so there was that stuff going on, but we even with all the hype and all the, the money that went into the promotion of that record, it, it didn't it didn't warrant the hype. In other words, it, it didn't even we had to go gold in order for us to break even. Yeah, I like the first uh, album. I think it's a pretty good one. I think so too. Uh, and Bruce and I, we, I'm still very good friends with all of the guys in the band, which is I I, I value that more than anything. Yeah, me and Bruce are in touch. He sent me a bunch of stuff to to, to uh, auction at, at the sh uh, cancer benefit I'm doing this weekend. Uh, Michael Bolton sent me a bunch of his signed stuff to, to raffle off for charity. I'm still in touch with Jimmy. We just recently did a Zoom call. All of us is sort of like a, a reunion of sorts. And so, yeah, I love that band. It was my first one. It's like, you know, your first girlfriend was always, your first kiss is always the special one. Yeah. Uh, well, my first, my first band was, uh, it was awesome. And I value the fact that we're still all in touch with each other. That is awesome. And then uh, you got to work with uh, Pat Travers on Radioactive and Black Pearl. So how did that come about? Well, that came about, as I alluded to before, when the Blackjack, uh, two albums with Blackjack was on Polydor Records. Mm -hmm. um, then Benny Mardonis' record was on Polydor Records. And I became close friends with, um, I, was, I was being dubbed as uh, Polydor's house drummer because I, I was playing on different projects of Polydor. And I got a call from one of the A&R guys saying, hey, man, I heard, uh, and Pat Travers was also on Polydor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard right. that Pat is going thinking about firing Tommy Aldridge. Or, this was in 1980. 
uh, here, don't tell him I told you, but here's Pat's manager's number. So I got in touch. I went and met with the manager. He said, no, we're not going to fire Tommy, but here's a board tape, a, a show tape, if you ever, if you want to listen to it. So he gave me a cassette. I went over home and started rehearsing it, just not knowing if anything was going to come about. And I got a call about maybe I mean, four or five months later asked by David saying, uh, hey, you want to come and audition for Tr Travers? So I flew down to Orlando and I play. I auditioned for Travers on Tommy Aldridge's drum set, by the way, and um, uh -huh. got the gig. And, um, you know, that was in December of 1980. And then right after the new, I did a couple of live gigs with Pat as sort of like an audition down in Florida. And uh, asked me to join the band. And then I think in January, February of 81, we were in the studio making Radioactive. And then we went on tour with Rainbow in the spring of 81. And, and then we stayed out. We, we opened for everybody, basically, and did some big festivals. And that was my introduction to be, you know, in a band. That's why I'm grateful for Pat for that opportunity, because I was with a national act. And that was my first national recognize, nation, nationally recognized act with... And he would, you know, he had some some uh, some nationwide hits with Boom Boom and Snort Whiskey and whatever. Yeah. So that put me, you know, we opened for everybody, Hard and Blue Oyster Cult and Ted Nugent and and all of that. So I was playing arenas on a daily basis, and that was my first. Uh, well, aside from that that Peter Frampton tour with Blackjack, we played arenas then too. But so that was, um, you know, that's where I got Travers's gig is where I got my drum endorsements, my uh, cymbal endorsement, my stick endorsement. So that that put me on the national radar, basically, where people were wondering, fans of Travers were wondering, who's this guy replacing Tommy Aldridge in the band? Because I love Tommy, great drummer. Um, mm -hmm. It was kind of a, kind of a, a perk for me to actually replace a great drummer in a, in a really, at the time, a really, really good band. And I then Travers led to, you know, that led to, led to Cindy's gig and it, you know it's like it's like the universe man sometimes when the universe puts problems in front of you it's a test to see how bad you want to overcome that problem and if you okay. rise to the occasion and, and stand up and brush yourself off and rise to the occasion the universe rewards you man I had no idea where these gigs were going to come from right I, didn't... I had no idea you know but the, 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 every every really good gig that I've gotten in my life has been, been a, 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 um, it's been a product of me treating somebody nicely, treating somebody like a human being. You know, I never really put the rock star hat on, and um, I always was, my, was myself, and I always treated people with respect, regardless of what title they had, or regardless of what band they were in or regardless you know it could be the janitor it could be my roadie i always treat people with respect and good things come from that when you when you when you when you make people fortunate for having crossed your path and you engage people as an equal regardless of what their bank account looks like or what their title is or what band they play in or what they do for a living or whatever you know the universe smiles on that and i call them when god winks at you you know, when you do something really yep. good for somebody, you get a God wink, you know, and it could be like pulling up to a restaurant and the, and looking for a parking space and somebody pulls out right as you're pulling up and you have your parking space right. You know, that to me is a God wink. And that's like an incidental little thing that happens and you don't think anything of, oh, that's just a coincidence. But sometimes a God wink happens and they can, they can change your life. That's a great way of looking at it, Sandy. I like that. Yep. Yep. How how does um, Cindy Lauper come into play? Well, that again, it's it's. I was with Travers. We played an arena. Um, we played an arena in Connecticut, and I was really in a big hurry. I was the last one out of the dressing room after the gig. Everybody else was on the bus in a really big hurry. I was gathering my stuff around the dressing room and trying to dry off and change my shirt and whatever. On my way out, there's this guy in the, in the doorway, and he's got a camera and a pen. And I could have blew by him, but I didn't blow by him. I engaged him, and I said, hey, buddy, I'm really in a ha hurry. Now, he's there to see me. He's not there to see Travers, because Travers is already on the bus with the rest of the band and crew, just waiting for me. And I, I, I said, well, this guy is here to see the drummer. He's not there to see Pat, so he, and he wants an autograph, so I'm going to friggin' engage him. 
So I said, what, what can I do for you, buddy? But I got to tell you, I'm really in a big hurry. He goes, would you sign this for me? You're a great drummer, blah, 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 blah. I signed it for him. He goes, what's your name? He said, I, he said Dave. So I signed it here, Dave. I got to go. He goes, a picture. What about a picture, Sandy, please? So he hold, holds up this Instamatic camera, takes a picture of us. And I said, Dave, I got to go. He said, oh, just one more thing. You got one more second. I go, what's the matter, Dave? He said, I'm a bass player here in Connecticut. Would you um, would you uh, um, uh, recommend me for some gigs in New York City? I said, well, I don't recommend you. I can't recommend you until I hear you play. So here's, uh, my, here's my card. Here's my home address, my home number. Send me a cassette of your playing, Dave, and I'll see what I can do in Manhattan. He said he couldn't believe I'm giving. He goes, this is Sandy giving me up my, my his no home number. And so I go, Dave, it's no big deal. Just send me a cassette. That's all. Oh, no, I can't believe you're giving me a home. I, could I call you? I said, Dave, you can call me anytime, but I got to get on the bus now. I'm going to get chastised if I don't get on the bus right now. He said, okay, well, thank you so much. I really, well, he sent me a cassette. Nothing really happened. Three years later, he calls me and he said, I'm managing this girl now, Sandy. She's going to be the biggest thing in 1984. Um, we're doing the record at the record plant. Um, I, I forget, the record plant at Hit Factory, one of those. Uh, come down to the studio and meet her. I want you to be in her band. We, we haven't put out the first record yet. So I said, David, I can't join a new band. I can't, I can't, I'm coming off an arena tour. I can't join a baby band and, and possibly waste a couple of months in trying to break this band. And, and you know, and, and all honestly, she's going to be the, you know, he said she's going to be the biggest thing in 1984. I said, well, in all honesty, Dave, everybody's new project is going to be the biggest thing. He said, Sandy, you were so nice to me in the doorway that, that night in Connecticut. Just come down and meet this woman. I think you're, you're playing with fit great with her material and you're going to love her you're going to look so i went down and it happened to be cindy and i ended up joining the band so that was a really really big opportunity for me because i saw that gig grow from you know playing smelly little smelly little bars with like two or three people sitting at the bar mm -hmm. at the end of 83 and at six months later she was selling five six million records playing arenas on amazing nights so that was came in enough for spending time in the doorway with Dave, but in in the audience one, one night during Cindy's tour, there was Joan Jett in the audience with her manager. Five years later, Joan called me uh, to join her band, so that's how I got that gig. <clears throat> and so the point of the story is, is that uh, when you do things for people, big things happen that could potentially change your life. Now that, that five minutes in the doorway with Dave, the Dave Wolf moment, mm -hmm led to the biggest tour I ever did at that point in time was the biggest tour I ever did in my life. And I saw the two, I saw an act go from zero to five million records. That was an experience. And in November of that year, 1984, I met a woman backstage in Charlotte, Charlotte uh, Coliseum. And that woman, long story short, ended up to be my wife. We, we met that night in November of 84. She moved up to New York to be with, we dated long distance all of 80, the rest of 84 and part of 85. November of 85, she moved up to New York. In 1990, we got married. In 1994, we had our first child and we're still together today from 1986. So that, you know, that's what, 36 years later? Yeah, you have an- The same woman? So that, that changed my life, I mean, Sometimes I think, what if you would have blew Dave Wolf off in that doorway and been an arrogant rock star and said, sorry, buddy, I don't have time to sign your shit. And, you know, I, how would my life be different? Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's like you, had, you have this aura of goodness around you. Well, you know what? I don't, I, I, the aura doesn't come to me. It doesn't, it doesn't come to people. The aura is produced by the way a person thinks and acts. Right. It doesn't come from the outside in, the aura. It comes from the inside out. And it, that, that, it, it's, according, it's according to the way you act and the way you think and the way you treat other people. And when, when, when you send that good aura out, then you get good aura back. 
And in yeah. my case, I had no idea where that good aura was going to come from. In other words, when I engaged that guy, Dave Wolf, in the doorway, I had no I, I didn't do it because, well, someday he's going to manage the biggest, the biggest star in 1984. I did it because he, I, I wanted to do it because it's, it's the right thing to do. And I had no idea. See, unlike other businesses, in the music business, when I get off the road with Lauper, I'm sitting in my apartment wondering where the next gig is going to be. My calendar is empty. So where it takes a tremendous amount of faith to be a musician in the music business and be, uh, you know, not being the artist. I mean, I consider myself an artist as a drummer, but I'm not a songwriter, and my songs are not the ones that go top ten. It's my drumming, and I'm associated with, with artists that, whose songs go top ten. So I have no idea where my career is going to go after, after every tour I've been on. I, I never hooked up where, okay, I'm getting off the road with Lauper and this date in 19, uh, you know, 87, 1986, and then I have the monkey tour coming up, and then I have, no, it's when the tour is over, my calendar is empty. So am I going to go... Well, I guess I did the, you know, I did the biggest tour in 1984. I guess I, I reached the pinnacle. Yeah. No, you just keep going and you keep going and you keep treating people right and you keep respecting and living your life right and good things happen as a result. So yeah. that's a good word you use, uh, it, it, Tommy. It's a good word you use, the aura, but the aura doesn't find you. You produce the aura by the way you treat other people and your perception, your positive perception of what the future is going to hold. Right. So at the end of Lopez tour, I don't go, oh, shit, I'm, not go I'm never going to get a gig like that again. I'm never going to, you know, if you think like that, well, guess what? <laughs> You're never going to get a gig like that again. Yeah. <laughs> but if you say to yourself, well, it's only a matter of time, just keep going, you never know who you're going to meet. You never know who you're going to, when you go jam at a club somewhere, you never know who's going to be in the audience. You never know, you never know, you never know. And you just keep on with a positive anticipation. If you go on my Facebook page, Tommy, I posted something um, yesterday or the day before. Mm -hmm. And it's a picture of a, a Christmas tree with Christmas presents underneath. And the, the, the text in support of that photo is that's the way you should look at the future. When you got up at five in the morning, when you, were, when you were six years old and you saw all those presents under the tree, you had no idea what was going to be in those presents, but you knew it was going to be good. And that's the way you look at the future. Nobody knows who's, what's going to happen tomorrow, but you have to anticipate a positive. You have to anticipate something good. And if something good doesn't happen, well, if an issue happens or a problem, we'll take that as a learning experience because there's always the next day. I see the picture. Okay. Yeah, that's a nice picture. It's a, it's a stock picture from the internet, but I need. I, I, I looked for a picture with Christmas presents, a Christmas tree with presents underneath. And that's the way I look at the future. It's like, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. That's why I say, you know, to worry about shit that you that hasn't even happened yet is a total waste of time. So don't worry about it. Just you have your choice. You know, you, every day the way you look at tomorrow is like looking at the fork in the road. You can look at positive or you can look at negative. We have the freedom of choice, and that's what a lot of people miss the point, or they're so ingrained in negative thinking. Oh no! Oh no! What, what, what if, what if we get a storm like they had in Louisiana? What if we get a fire like they have, in, and they, and they live there? What if, oh, we got to lock all the windows and doors. What, we got to, yeah. if somebody robs us, you know, you live your life in a state of fear. And that's, that's not happening, man. I, I never, I never believed in that. I have family members that I still try to talk out, talk out of living in a state of fear. Like, oh, we'll make sure all the doors locked. You know, well, what's that noise? Is somebody trying to break in? No, you know, don't worry about it. Yeah. Anyway, I, <laughs> I, I can talk your ear off when it comes to that stuff. Well, uh, you were in Cindy's video for Money Changes Everything, which was filmed at the Houston Arena. Did you guys know that it was going to be a music video, or was that just incidental? No, no, we definitely knew. It was all planned. I, I mean, 
No, it, we definitely knew. I mean, she didn't go up in the garbage can at, at every gig. Mm -hmm. You know, we I remember having a meeting uh, and Cindy wanted to go up in the garbage can and, and uh, they decided what they, first of all, it was it was a safety issue. So they got, they, they, they somehow rigged up with a garbage can and she was able to do that. And we did a sound check in the afternoon and we had, we were told that we had a, it was a summit auditorium in Houston, Texas, which went on to be the compact center where the Houston Rockets played. And now it's uh, Joel Osteen's church in that big arena in Houston. Joel Osteen's got, it's a Lakeview or Lakeside or whatever. But anyway, um, it, yeah, we knew it was going to be a video, and uh, we did. We had to wear the same clothes in the afternoon. We wore the same clothes that we were going to wear that night at the at the gig, and we they did all the close ups in the afternoon. We played money changes, everything. We did, they did all the close ups, and then that evening uh, at the gig, uh, by uh, radio station knew we were going to do a video, and, and they they announced to the. the to the public that we're going to do a video that night at the Summit Auditorium and um, or the Summit Arena, and um, everybody was told to wear white. Cindy wanted everybody in the audience to wear white, so it showed up really well in the video. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they did. We we you know during our regular concerts, Cindy said, "Okay, we're going to do our video, blah blah blah." And then we played "Money Changes Everything" like we did every single night. But on this night, video night, she went up in the garbage can and came back down or whatever. So, but it was all recorded live. And that's what the video soundtrack is, is our live performance. It wasn't lip syncing to the record. That's so cool. I like the, uh, the, the, the craft album. Well, how come that band didn't take off? Uh, that's a good question. I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. There were good songs. Uh, it was um, it was basically the idea of that it was uh, of that of craft was they wanted it to be a German uh, German journey. In other words, the <laughs> material was like power, powerful, crunchy guitars, but the but the, the melodies were kind of like journey, like sing, like good good melodies, good songs. And I don't know why, but it, that was one of my greatest experiences because I I played on that record. And the, the principles of that record were based in Germany, in Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. And I played played on the record, and then they asked me to, to, to go on the road live uh, to tour in support of that record. And we were the opening act for Queen in summer of 86, from like May up until September or something. It was one of the most awesome tours I ever did in my whole life. And got, getting to know the guys in Queen, it was awesome. Yeah, oh, that must have been amazing. I mean, they were still putting on really good shows back then. Absolutely. How about uh, working with Joan Jett? Uh, what about? Um, you got to play on the hit list, which was a cover album. Um, right. How, what, what's her process like? Uh, process in terms of what? In terms of musicianship, like, you know, how she chooses her covers and all of that. Uh, that, that I don't know. That You would have to ask her and her manager that. I know that a lot of those artistic decisions are made between Joan and her manager, her longtime manager, Kenny Laguna, who both, both of those people I love to death to this day. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still in touch with them to this day. They're, they're great, great people to work for. That's a wonderful organization to work for or to work with. And um, so I don't know, you know, uh, Joan was great. She was, she was awesome. She, everybody rode on the same bus. She wasn't like the star and then the band was separate. Every, uh, the band, the Blackhearts did a lot of things uh, in conjunction with Joan. I mean, Joan wanted the band included in a lot of stuff. She was definitely a band person. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a great, she's a great leader. She knows exactly what she wants. Uh, she has great ears. She hears everything that happens on the stage. She's a, an excellent businesswoman. Um, and so was Cindy, actually. Uh, but, yes, I, I have no regrets. There's no regrets working with Joan. I love the opportunity, and she loved to tour in out-of-the-way places, so I got to see and, and perform in places like Singapore and Thailand and Taiwan and uh, Seoul, Korea, and, you know, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So 
It was a great experience. I love Joan to death. And, and I, as I said, as with most artists I've worked for in the past, I'm still in touch with them on an intermittent, in, intermittent basis just to say hello. Yeah, I like that that version of the Kinks Cellular Cellul Heroes, which people call you know the Kinks version the best song never to reach number one on the charts. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's a great song. I like it, and of course you yeah, got. I, do too. I and, like the, the Kinks were another. You mentioned the Kinks when you mm -hmm. mentioned Dave Clark Five, and we were talking about the British Invasion. The Kinks were another band that that. My first, one of my first bands, Emil, you know, did uh, You Really Got Me and Dedicated Follower of Fashion and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, with the, the early kinks, I'm really a big fan of the early kinks stuff. And you got to be a Keith Moon guy, too, for The Who. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, we, that first, the Black and Blues band did some Who stuff. I remember, I remember vividly, vividly, Rehearsing down in, in that in, well, on my black and blue set with the Victrola, re uh, learning Happy Jack, which was one of the first one of the, I think one of the first singles that um, uh, that the Who had. It was one of their first releases. Happy Jack. It was awesome. It was a really good song. There was some awesome fills in there too. Yeah, Keith was Keith, was, but yeah, Keith was an awesome a, a early influence to me. Mm hmm. Yesterday I did a tribute to the monkeys with uh, Fred Velez, and he says hi to you. Oh, awesome, Fred! Fred, what, what does Fred do? Um, he's uh, he's in the the East Coast, and um, he just wrote his uh, second book, and um, he's been having health issues, but um, he's hanging in there. Well, what, what does he have to do with the monkeys? Well, he uh, he wrote um, uh, a book about you know his fandom for them, and then he's written wrote a second book about them and stuff. You know, he's been the master of c ceremonies for all their events for like forty years now. Oh, I see. Okay, I might have I might have helped. I might have like met him at some point, like a convention or something. Oh yeah, he remembers you. That's why he said he. That's why he said hi. And oh, stuff. good. Okay, yeah. Well, tell him hello for me. I'm sorry I didn't recognize his name. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, playing with those guys, I mean, they're they're probably a little bit more show busy, right? Um, well, I don't know what you mean by show busy. Well, because they're they're from you know that that old school you know showbiz you know, and they're they're actors and entertainers and all of that. Right. Yeah. Well, that, it was it was you know that's another situation I'm very grateful for because it's. One of the things I love about this business is being able to, you know, grow up with certain bands and then years later find yourself on stage with the with the band that you admired. I remember rushing home from school to watch the beginning of the Monkees TV show and mm -hmm. watching that t t TV show week after week and loving them because it reminded me of the early Beatles. It reminded me of when I saw Hard Day's Night. And it, it, it was basically, I, I come to find out that the, the monkeys were put together, modeled after the early Beatles, after the Hard Day's Night. You know, a band and all the hijinks, and they all live together, and they're trying to escape the crowds and the fans and, and all of that. And um, so having the opportunity to play with them was really, really special to me. And uh, me and Davy Jones became really, really close friends during, I did almost every reunion tour that the monkeys did from... 87 up until Davey passed away. Not every single one, but I did most of the reunion tours that they did. And then as well as Davey's solo gigs in between monkey tours and Mickey Dolan's solo gigs in between monkey tours. And by the way, everybody listening to this, the Davey, I mean, Mickey Dolan's and Mike Nesmith are taking the monkeys out uh, this fall. Right. Um, I'm not I'm not in this version of the monkey backing band, but um, a lot of my good friends are, and uh, so I encourage you. It might it may they're advertising it as the last the last farewell tour the monkeys ever going to do. But keep in mind there's only two remaining alive monkeys, which is Mickey Dolan's and Mike Nesman, with a backing band. But I encourage everybody to get some tickets because uh, you may not see hear that material played live ever again. Yeah, I saw them in 1997 at Candlestick Park. They were playing before a Giants game, and um, oh, I was there. Yeah, yeah. And um, at, at the end of the show, they got in like a Cadillac with the top down, and then rode off the field. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, I remember being uh, being. Uh, I, I got 
changed. We I think we got changed in the visitors' locker room that that that, that day. Being a baseball fan, I love I love doing gigs like that. Um, in baseball stadiums, a lot of times we played like we we would be the event at a minor league baseball game. But just being around baseball, it was I loved it. Right. So so what are you doing these days? Well, these days I'm playing in a uh, in a cover band, a '70s '80s cover band called Rock United here in uh, Nashville, and we do corporate events and uh, casinos and stuff. And uh, but most of my time is taking up. I still do a little bit of teaching in my studio downstairs, so some some drum instruction and stuff, music business instruction. Mm-hmm. And uh, but mostly what's taking most of my time is uh, uh, speaking to corporate. I use the lessons that I've learned, and a lot of to- a lot of those things, the elements I speak about to corporate is what we spoke about today about karma, about you know how you produce your own karma or whatever, and it's not luck, it's not coincidence, it's not any of that. You know, it's visualization mm-hmm. and the positive anticipation of events yet to happen, um, and, vis- and visualizing in detail what you want to happen and how you want it to happen and how you're going to feel as if it did happen. And so I speak to corporate on that, and that's that's starting to take off because I include like little clips of me playing with Cindy or Joan or you know Monkeys or Travers or you know I use little tiny little 10, 15 second clips to demonstrate a point in my power. And so now corporate CEOs are seeing this presentation, and it really really resonates with them because most CEOs these days were were kids smoking their first joint at a Pat Travers show, you know, in the 80s. So, uh, you know, now fast forward, now they're corporates, cor- corporate executives, CEOs owning their own businesses and stuff, And but they remember those days. So music resonates with everybody, um, especially 80s music. If you're 50, 50, 60-year-old, 40, 50, 60 years old today, you remember those songs, you know? Right. So that's basically what I'm doing today. I speak to associations. I speak to, you know, corporate, uh, private companies. I speak to conferences and stuff like that. So that that's basically what's occupying most of my time. But um, I still enjoy playing, and I'm an equal partner in this band called Rock United. So um, so I keep my foot in the drumming uh, drumming arena there, and so everything is hunky dory. Yeah, do you have any upcoming uh, gigs? Has anything opened up uh, during COVID? Um, no, I mean every everything uh, you know everything shut down during COVID, so uh, yeah. everything is starting to open up a little bit now. It's starting to get a little bit tentative because of the new variant. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, you know we're we're still playing out. We're playing at a casino coming up at the end of the beginning of October up in Kentucky. Uh, so. You know, things are moving along. Everybody's got to be smart and be protected, and um, hopefully we can stem this tide of this freaking virus, and things will be get back to normal. And how, and how was the uh, Rock and Pod Expo? Oh, it was great. Yeah, we had, I had a good time. I, Chris invites me almost every year to, to be part of that, and I enjoy being part of it. I like the, uh, talking to people, and I like... Uh, you know, sharing sharing my experiences and in the hope that it helps somebody going through the same thing that I went through, and so yeah, sharing my experience and the, any kind of meet and greet is always fun for me, and and I still get a kick out when somebody asks me to sign a piece of paper. I'm going what, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I still appreciate that, and uh, so for that reason, I do it if it's going to help somebody or inspire somebody or help somebody through a difficult time, then I'm there. Wonderful. I want to thank you so much for coming on today, Sandy. This has been great. Well, you're welcome, Tommy. And, uh, you know, I apologize for the, you know, we kept postponing because of my schedule or whatever, but you hung in there and, and you hung in there and we made it happen. And I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I hope your listeners enjoyed it too. Thank you so much, sir. Yes, I'm always, I'm always hanging in. I'm always patient. So you have yourself a great day and please stay safe. I, I, I appreciate it, and you do the same, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Sandy Gennaro. Ain't he a sweetheart? Ain't he a cool dude? He's all, he's, all, he's all of the above, a sweetheart, and he's a cool dude. Oh, my God. Just the, 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 the great attitude that he has towards life, that's just phenomenal. You know, you don't see that very often in the industry. 
Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. And keep the beat.